Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Mike Emler, knife maker, designer, and professional sharpener. Mike first got my attention years back when he posted a video to his fled fledgling channel giving his unvarnished opinion of Emerson knives. I did not like him much because uh, of that video, but later I realized, unfortunately, Mike knows what he's talking about, and I was just being a fanboy. Uh, so much so that his freakish sharpening skills were recruited by the custom division of Ferrum Forge. Two successful collaborations brought a sample of his custom work to the broader market with the Wee Rockfish and the Artisan Sea Snake. And these days, he's got a great channel on YouTube with a variety of knife content. I've been on his talk show, which was a total blast. Uh, but it's his knowing and in-depth knife reviews that I like the best. He's one of those, quote unquote, trusted voices I talk about all the time. Now we're going to talk about trends, picks and pans, and the state of the knife world. But first, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And you can also download the show to your favorite podcast app and listen while you do the stuff you have to do in your daily life. And then, as always, if you want to help support the show, uh, you can do that by going to Patreon and joining at any level uh, you so choose. We also have a great annual subscription at Patreon where you save probably more than I should have even set up. You save quite a bit, 12%, I think. Uh, so check that out. And uh, that's just thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, if you want to help support us, it's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Mike. <laughs> I like doing? the new intro. I absolutely love that new intro. <laughs> Ever drop a knife, even though you know it's going to get any use every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the story of my life. It feels good to strop, man. It's, sometimes you can go too far, especially depending on the strop compound you're using. But uh, I do no. have to admit, I got some of that gunny juice, uh, the, the the diamond emulsion. And it, it, it <laughs> as much as I might have disagreed with the whole thing with uh, KPL, and uh, gunny juice, that, that strop compound is is pretty good. It's probably the best uh, diamond emulsion strop compound I've ever used. So it's colloidal diamond, basically, suspended in some sort of oil or something? <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know exactly, but it, it sets up, it dries really good. It, it cuts really well. Like it'll, it'll strop a knife back from the verge of, I'm going to have to put this on a stone like, like that. It just cuts so quick. Wow. So I do have to admit it's a good product. All right. So obviously, you know what you're talking about in terms of sharpening. You have Mike Emler, Crazy Sharp. Crazy Sharp is your company. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a knife that you made Crazy Sharp. This was my I could never get it sharp Spidey Chef. You also indulged me and gave me that awesome clip at the tip. Love that. And did that beautiful finish. That was fun. Yeah, that finish, that finish was fun. I had never done that finish on that steel. So I didn't know. I mean, I knew it would work, but I wasn't sure. Like how long is it going to take and and stuff like that it came out it came out really nice i i really did like doing that finish and it, it's 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 not a complicated finish it's just really time consuming all right so you sharpened this by hand <laughs> on a stone tell me all about how uh tell us all about how you got into sharpening and uh how you got to be so good at it well i mean i we kind of talked about it when i did the podcast the very first time it's the same thing i told Ellie, you know i grew up on a farm and we butchered uh, you know, we did calf cow, we did dairy, we did all kinds of stuff. And we basically, we were self-sustaining. So we would butcher and we would hunt and butcher the animals that we hunted. We butchered animals on the farm. And when you were growing up, the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the kids weren't big enough or old enough to cut the, the cuts of meat, butterfly steaks and stuff like that, especially for anything that was going to get sold per se. Mm -hmm. uh, and so stuff we kept, we were able, I, I got to cut stew meat and stuff, but the kids would learn how to sharpen. So knives would just rotate over to where the younger ones were and you would sharpen the knife up and it would roll back up because cutting meat and cutting flesh, it, it's, it's, it does a lot of damage to the edge. So that's how I started learning how to sharpen. And I always had a small little Arkansas stone in my pocket uh, for on the farm, you know, 400 plus acres, you're out there. If your knife gets dull, wow. you're not going to run all the way back to the house to sharpen your knife. You're going to pull that little slip stone out of your pocket. And you're just going to touch the edge up. And then uh, 
then I, I went to Japan and I studied martial arts for years and I had gotten into knives and I started looking at how Japanese swords were constructed and that, that really cool apple seed grinder axe blade grind that they have that really, uh, it kind of just, it, it's really robust and it cuts really well and it pushes material out of the way and it's, it's a lot more frictionless. So you can have that thin edge, but still have a lot of material behind it. And I was like, hey, there's gotta be a way to duplicate that. And so I just started on cheap knives. I just took some cheap crappy stones that I had and I would, I'd try to duplicate that rocking motion and, and bring those angles all together. Like I saw the Japanese sword polishers do in videos, because at that time, you know, this was just about the time I had met my wife and everything that I really started getting into it. And then my father-in-law being a carpenter in Japan taught me how to properly use Japanese water stones. Mm -hmm. And that really, like, once I got to a point where I was using like good stones on good knives, that's when it really, I was like, wow, that's this like not to toot my own horn, but beep, beep, I'm pretty good at this. And that's when I started offering it to people that I worked with and I would sharpen our knives. The guys on the ship always needed sharp knives. And then when I came back stateside, I, I was with Expedition Combat for a couple of years and then I got medically retired and I kind of turned it into a side business. And then when I just got fed up with my government job, I, I just basically turned it into my only business and it, it worked out pretty well for a couple of years. And then things got real tight and then I took another job doing construction and now I got, got put out of work because I got some medical issues and I turned the YouTube job. The same thing I did with the sharpening I did with YouTube. I just went, I'm like, well, I don't have a lot of options. I'll just do what I can do. And so I upped the content to two videos a day. It started out, it was like one video a month and then it was like one video a week. And then it was like four videos a week. And now I'm at like four video or three, three things that go up a day. So usually on Monday and Wednesday and Friday, there's a two hour live feed at lunchtime. There's a short, and in the morning, there's a video, a full length video at, at 3 a.m. So at 6 a.m. Eastern, when you get up, you can watch that video. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, there's two videos and a short, if I can get the short done. But I don't know if you know this, doing that many videos yeah. <laughs> daily really takes a lot of time with the edit and doing green screen and audio, and intro, outro, and then figuring out tags. And now I have affiliate links. I actually have a Blade HQ affiliate link. I actually shot a short intro for my videos like, hey, let's talk about today's sponsor, me. I've set up affiliate links and anything you purchase, it doesn't cost you anything extra and it sponsors the channel, supports the channel. So the affiliate link stuff, it, it doesn't pay out a, a lot right now, but it, as talking with Jared, like I know that Jared Neves has had his just monthly increase and so is mine. People realize that I have affiliate links and that they can use those links to purchase thing anywhere on Blade HQ once they log in. and. And then they start purchasing things and and that that money starts to accumulate and then more videos that have those links so it, it was a hundred percent like i just i really can't do much right now i just got out of the hospital i had a a, a life-threatening uh infection in my intestines uh the second round of it this time it was a lot worse and i was in the hospital for uh three or four days and yeah, so now those. i'm like i absolutely can't go do construction so every time every time i think things are going to look better and i can go back to actually doing physical work things changed. I actually resigned from the construction company. I'd been on their roster for over a year without working. And I was like, I just not fair to them. Uh, so physically I can't do it. So I just resigned, uh, as of yesterday. Okay. So you, you are, um, well, as I mentioned up front, you not only sharpen, you not only, um, have your YouTube channel, but you've also designed knives. And I'm listening to you talk about your YouTube channel and you are incredibly prolific. And uh, I've noticed that uh, a lot of the very prolific, um, well, online reviewers design knives and have knives made. Now you've done that. You've done it. You did it differently. You did it through we and artisan. And mm -hmm. uh, tell me about that. And, and, and what do you think of this? Um, well, this trend of enthusiasts and uh, knife reviewers designing uh, knives and having them built in China. Uh, so I love knives. I don't care where they come from. We talked about this before. Everybody talks about the like, oh, don't buy Chinese knives. And I'm like, okay, but you're posting this from your phone that was made. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I don't put a lot of stock in that. I would love to be able to have everything on my channel be American made. I would love that. I would love to only have American knives come in on the channel. But the fact is, if I relied on American knives, American made knives for content, I would do like one video a month and you right. would see the same video every other month. Yeah. I just can't get them in. The price of them is different. Um, and I, I just wanted to go 
you know, I was working with Elliot Williamson. He's the one that helped teach me how to make knives, taught me like, well, I, he likes to say he didn't teach me anything. It's like, there's the grinder, it's a piece of metal, don't screw it up. And, but he did, he did provide a lot of guidance. I'm like, okay, if I wanted to do this, how would I do it? To walk me through it and then I would go physically do it. Um, but this whole trend, I, I don't have a problem with it. If you can get a knife design and you think it's a viable design, go ahead and do that. What I have a problem with is some of these, the, the people that, that review knives that think they're going to make a design and then they go ahead and they pitch it to a couple companies and then they go, I, I'm not saying I think it's a bad idea financially for any one of the companies. What I have a problem is they're putting themselves at risk of spending a lot of money. Like when you, if you mm -hmm. try to pitch a design to a couple of knife companies and they come back and they say, you know, that's not what we're looking for. And you get enough of those. I've got several designs that have went nowhere and I won't do an OEM on them because I know I'm going to take a bath on it. Because if a company knows what will and won't sell and they're telling you no, that's probably the best advice you're ever going to get. A knife company knows what they can and can't sell. And if they're telling you no, that would be the best decision to just go, you know, hey, maybe I shouldn't do this. Do you do you mean to say if they won't license your design, you shouldn't yes. have it made? I'm not saying you shouldn't, but just be advised. You might be doing it just because you love that design. The sea snake. I see what you're saying. Yeah. The sea snake, the small little fixed blade. I never yeah. had any illusions I was ever going to make very much money on it. And I really haven't. I mean, I'm they've sold a lot. I make a I make a paltry amount every quarter. Like maybe enough to buy a good budget knife every quarter but that wasn't the point i had made the yep. customs and i made those customs were six to eight hundred dollars a piece depending on the steel and handles and stuff like that and there was a lot of love that went into them and i looked at it and i was like this is a viable design i can i get it out there if i don't make any money on it i'm really not that hurt about it because i wasn't making that much money on it to begin with and i'm not making any money on it by letting it sit in a drawer and I thought it was a viable design. Now, if you if that's the reason that you're going with an OEM and you're just willing to just like just sell them at cost because you're passionate about the design and you're maybe it'll take off in the future and there'll be enough people that really enjoy it, then that's fine. But like if you're getting input from people and they're telling you that like this design isn't something that we think will sell, or if you're getting advice or like I've had <laughs> I literally had a guy, Jared Neves told me about this that wanted to sue me because I did a review of a knife and I said, like, these are the items that aren't for me. For me, it's not a knife. I know it's a well-built knife and this and that. I said all over, overall it was a good knife. They wanted to sue me because I was disparaging the design because I'm a fellow knife designer, knife maker. He felt that I was kind of out of like, oh, he's putting that. If you can't take that kind of criticism, like if you're going to put a design out, like think about guys that come up with this. Look at the sh I'm sorry, I don't want to curse too much on your show, but look at the shit that John Grimsmo took for this design. Right. I love this knife. If you're not willing to take that kind of, uh, you know, criticism, like that looks like crap, or there's this is wrong with this knife, or why is the pocket clip like this? You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be putting designs out there. I mean, I, am I am I critical of advice that I get or somebody disparaging my design? Does it hurt? Yeah. But can I look at it and go, okay, yeah, that might be something I want to look at if I make another design. Yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, that is thing. That is relatively speaking, that is nothing. I mean, people endure so much more in terms of criticism and uh, kind of harsh feedback than someone saying, you know, giving constructive criticism. In a way, I think you know, I asked you, what do you think of this trend? And I, you know, the term trend sometimes can sound. Uh, like have a bad connotation. I don't mean it that way. This enthusiast slash YouTube reviewer uh, uh, trend I, making knives, I really like because um, I do too. It's because a, you yeah. get so much more diversity coming out of the knife yes. world. It's so many things that that you might you might have a bunch of stuff that just doesn't work, and you're like, yeah. why would you do that? Yeah. But then there's also that niche community. Like, think about arcane designs. Like, right. if he if he had listened to a lot of the old the old guard, those knives yeah. would have never existed. People are like, yeah. what the fuck is this? This is garbage. This is yeah. horrible. Why would you even think that's a good idea? And they resonate with people and guys like Elijah Isham, you know, a good friend of mine just recently passed. Look at his designs. Imagine if he had tried to do that, like making knives with Chinese companies to circle back around onto that. Mm -hmm. Imagine if he had tried to do that with a company like Case 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Like if, if he had um, tried to come up with that design 30 years ago, people would have laughed him out of the room. They would have been like, get, get out of here. There's no way. But because there were, there are companies that are willing to, you know, Hey, if they, if we think there might be some money to be made on it, we'll do it. And so some of those companies that are more willing to take risk because they're not taking as big a risk because it's not as expensive. If I was trying to get something made by Greg Medford, would I have like tried to take a chance with some of these other designs? Absolutely not. Greg's knives are going to be expensive to make because as much as I might not agree with Greg on a lot of things, Greg probably makes some of the best made knives in mm -hmm. this country. <clears throat> like if you get a knife that's made by Medford, even if it's an OEM for like Strider or some of the other guys that he's done some OEM for, you're probably going to get the best version of that knife that has ever existed. I've, I've, because, I've had that inkling, especially with Strider. Yeah. I mean, I don't like Greg's actual knives. <laughs> like I have one here. I have the, the I N F T I, whatever the infant, uh, in, one of the in, old in, school ones that he yeah. did. I hate it. It's horrible, but I can also look at it go, the machining on this is it's some of the best I've ever seen. Yeah. And the action is incredible. I, oh, I love cool. washer action and you get some amazing washer action, uh, even though that they are ridiculous designs on the whole. Um, I just wanted to finish my thought. I was saying uh, that that the I like it because uh, the enthusiast thing, uh, it's a mode of self-expression from all of these different people that you you grow to know and like because you watch their videos all the time. You know what I'm saying? And now you have something you can put in your pocket that came from them. Um, so there's a personal thing there. It, you, even if it never goes wider than uh, than that, I like it. Uh, but B or two, however I started, um, okay. I, I like that, uh, uh, that, that, well, not only you have a chance to own something that these people, uh, have made and it's their thing, but these people spend all of this time, uh, scrutinizing knives, all of the best knives that come through their, um, their review tables and they decide you know, they, they take all of those things and put them together. I mean, I feel like you did that with the sea snake because that's, that is a true EDC fixed blade. I have a bunch of EDC fixed blades that I cannot carry every day. I can carry the sea snake every day. I used to have the all black one, gave it to a friend in need. I but, had an all black one and gave it away as well. <laughs> Cause I mean, I can get them pretty easily. I, I, uh, yeah. I know the, I know the company that makes them, <laughs> but, but that thing, I mean, you distilled that down into a very, thin blade stock, thin, thin handle. The whole package is small enough to fit in your pocket if you want it to, or around your neck easily. Uh, but you get a full grip with the choil mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and multiple by the way, grips, it's a wicked... that was the whole thing. I wanted, I wanted multiple grips. I wanted yeah. you to be able to get back on it for heavy cutting. I wanted you to get closer up on for a little bit more detailed cutting. And I wanted that back nice and round. So you get clear up on it for very at the front, like cut out, duty stuff where you might be cutting around something or doing some detail, real close detail work. So I, I wanted multiple grips on that. And, and, and also it's got great tactical stuff, uh, tactical application. You could use that if you needed to like any knife, but that one kind of seems like it might excel at it. Um, but can you think of any other enthusiast community that is like that, where you can just be like, like oh. Oh, I love jazz. So I'm just going to, commission a South jazz South. tune you know like you can't just like that it's not no and that's the cool thing about the knife community is there is you can have that input and a lot of knife makers if you if you approach it correctly um even with all the criticism that i've given emerson knives ernie emerson has never treated me badly at a show as a matter of fact i was at the show in uh at blade show west in um long beach uh, Nick Shabazz and I drove up there together. And so I go and I'm walking around and Ernie was looking at me. He's like waving, like, Hey, come up. And I was like, no, no, because every one of these tables, like stink. I, <laughs> I'm like, nah, but he's like, I, you, he's like, you should stop by and check out the coffee thing I'm doing. I'm like, it's okay, Ernie. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm not stopping by. <laughs> <laughs> Your guys are going to kick my ass. <laughs> so I, I'm a pretty good fighter, but I, you know, how many guys is it going to like, I don't want to find yeah, out how he, many guys. He, he comes with a big so. crew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But no, but, it's it's really cool because you don't see that in the watch industry. You don't see that in the in the car industry. Like if you if you go to a car show and you say anything like, ah, it would have been cool if you'd done this, 
they're, they're going to drive you out of that. They're going to drive you out of the place. Get, get out of here. We don't want to talk to you. Watch yeah, and also, video. and also, uh, it, how easy is it to be like, oh, I have an idea for a car. I'm going to just design it or draw it and have someone else help me design it and uh, have an OEM yeah. in China make. I mean, I, I just think, I just think that that aspect of it is amazing too. But it's cool because it is. We have brought with us through history the most primitive of tools. The only tool that is more primitive than a knife is the hammer that you use to make it, whether that's a rock chip flint or a steel hammer to, to, or a brass hammer or whatever you used to lay that metal flat to make a blade. It is the second most primitive tool that mankind has right after the hammer, because you have to have a hammer to make a knife. And it, it's just cool that we still have that affinity to something that arcane and that old and that ancient, that it ties us back to a, a more primitive time. And we still, it's, I swear, like people ask me, well, what's the most, like you say knives or tools, what's your most used tool? And I was like, my knife, like I will use my knife multiple times throughout a day. How many times do I use a, 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 a screwdriver? How many times do I use? Oh yeah. I've gotten into the thumbnails too. I've actually gotten a lot better at, uh, at thumbnails. I don't know if you oh. noticed that <laughs> since Jim's scrolling up my, uh, yeah. <laughs> my face, but no, that, that's but that. The thing with knife makers and the knife community, it, it, it's kind of a primal thing that we have a connection to through these tools. I, I agree. I couldn't agree more. I feel like it's in our genetics somehow or in our genetic memory, um, just like it's fear like a of campfire. snakes and other things. Yeah. Or, yeah. or the comfort you get from sitting around a campfire. That's that genetic memory from the caveman days where the only safety you had at night was having a fire and that, that comfort you get sitting around a campfire is something that is just a genetic memory that throws back that affinity to knives is kind of the same thing. There's a, uh, uh I'm going to quote, uh, Homer. And I don't remember <laughs> if it was the Iliad or the Odyssey, but I have it underlined a thousand times. And it was steel has a way of drawing men to it. <laughs> I just think that's such a cool line. It sounds like it came from the mouth of Conan. You know what I mean? I love, I love, I love that book. The Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. I, I have a friend that is a literature professor, and he was like, uh, he's like, I have to force my students to read that. Oh, like, once you start, though, you're level, like, oh, my like, God, it's all monsters and adventure yeah. and murder. Like, he's like, and like, like, you're the only person. He's like, you are the only person I know that has read that book. I read that book about once a year. Yeah, I, have, yeah, yeah. I was like 20. I, I read it the first time in my 20s, and I have read it almost every year. For the and I'm 47 now, so you figure at least 17 times I've read that book. 27 times, I should say. So we were talking about fixed blades, and I yes. do want to. I want to absolutely give. I want to give Bastion a real big call out because I love my sea snake design, and I do like that Yojimbo fixed blade. Uh -huh. And I thought that the Yojimbo fixed blade was one of the best self defense fixed blades out there. A pretty good one. Until I got this Bastinelli La Sanction. This is probably the best small fixed blade self-defense knife jumping all the way up. Nice curved back. Just perfect. You're locked in on it. This is probably the best small self-defense knife I have ever had in my hand. I, I Okay, so you're uh, the second person to say that. Uh, uh, Dave of This Old Sword Blade Reviews loved that knife too. I, oh, yeah, I, love, I love anything Bastinelli, uh, anything Bastion puts his hand to is amazing. I mean, he's, yeah. he's a, he's got a, a natural talent, you know, he's a crazy French dude too. Like yeah. I love the story he tells about like they told him like that big, that big ass folder that he made. There was like, that's the knife that got me kicked out of France. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, oh, they said, it's too big. You've got to make this knife here. He like, <laughs> got him kicked out. You should of go France. somewhere else. <laughs> it's like, funny. It's um, funny. I, uh, last year at blade show, he, he has a very, he's got a big like corner booth set up. Uh, very well put together and, and, you know, artistic, everything he does is kind of artistic. And it's funny. He had like, he, he had like three or four of these guys who look like they just washed out of the French foreign legion uh, by, <laughs> by way of Calvin Klein. And they're standing there like selling knives and all these like ladies are flocking. To, and I'm like, of course it's like the smooth he's, Frenchman selling knives. Selling yeah, I was like you really sneaky cool froggy bastard. <laughs> you are a clever, clever dude. 
so so uh that knife what else are, are you going kind of uh enthusiastic about lately different knives uh um so know. I've had a bunch of stuff. So Jared, Jared has been sending me literally boxes of stuff. I ran out of room. I have a seven foot set of shelves and they are all full right now. Oh, um, some of it's sharpening. I did, I did the shop tour. I don't know if you saw that video the shop tour yeah. that I did a couple Sundays ago. Uh, actually it was the Sunday I was in the hospital that it aired and I was like, Oh, I watched it. I watched it premiere um, from the hospital before they put me on narcotics. And I was like, Oh, it's sleepy time. <laughs> um, but he has sent me so much stuff and uh, there's a couple things that I have really, really found that I like. Now, one of them is a knife, a specific knife. And it's this, actually, this didn't come from Jared. This came from Beardo the Weirdo, one of my YouTube subscribers. This is that Hogue X, X1MF uh, at Elizawitz Design. And it's a, it is a very, very unique feeling knife in the action. And it has like a, a weird detent. Like you can see it drop down to a point. It's a button lock. And then it, can you hear it? Let me get yeah. next to the microphone. It clicks in. And I don't yeah. know, I, I don't, I, I hate taking apart button locks because there's always that deal with that little spring. And <laughs> these were not meant for, for small, <laughs> fine, fine yeah, right. but I'm really curious about what's doing that. And okay. it's, it's amazing. The action I'm very familiar great. with that knife. I'm sorry I'm interrupting you here, but I, I have to jump in. Uh, a guy who works right next to me at work has that knife. And it was on my suggestion i think uh, i think i just wanted to check it out when it came out he asked me what knife he should get he loves it and it's every time awesome yeah. but there is that interesting yes yeah, that, <laughs> it's, that it's, little click. it's a very satisfying feel and i don't fidget with knives often because i know that you're detracting from the life of the knife you're causing undue stress in that knife but this thing like i have to hide it from myself sometimes because i literally will sit and be like that is that is neat. That's neat. That is really Grat cool. gratifying. What else do you like about that knife? I I, I dig the I, blade. I like I like a lot about it. The blade shape. I like the way it feels in hand. I wish it had a better blade to handle ratio. Like mm -hmm. the handle is. I, I'm really big about like one to one. Like something that's closer to one to one. But that that's like everything. I like the look of it. It looks like a shark. It looks mm -hmm. like a predatory fish. I dig it. It's, it's everything about it. And then other things that I've learned about myself over the course of Jared sending me probably a hundred knives uh, for review on the channel because he's got so much stuff and he started saying, I was such a big frame lock guy and I still am. I love frame locks, but I've always been a fixed blade guy and I don't know why I didn't gravitate sooner. Liner locks, you get all the benefits and the, the, the same action that you get out of a flipper frame lock but without losing that right there where that mm -hmm. knife opens up and then that drops in there's a sharp spot there and on a frame lock you have to deal with that on a liner lock you don't there is no change in that it feels exactly the same but you get the same and modern liner locks are every bit as strong where they may have already been as strong but i think i just had garbage liner locks i'm like that's not uh -huh. a good lock you know the, the liner locks that I'm seeing are every bit as strong for what you're going to do on a day-to-day -day basis with a, a frame lock and you don't have that level of discomfort. And I mean, you're not giving up anything and you still are getting a very reliable lock that is the same deployment, but without the discomfort or change. And then you have those options where you can put like addition. Then you have those two color options. Like you can see the gold and red on this one. The video on this one goes yeah. up tomorrow. This is that Iron Man uh, Lotvid Mini from oh. uh from uh is this kaiser yeah kaiser and so i mean it's like a grown-up swiss army knife yeah <laughs> yeah it's the, I, you, you, I hear you about the liner locks i've been kind of gravitating back towards them a lot recently too in and and especially in my purchase of um you know some of the some of the more i don't know chinese knives i don't know how how else to put it uh, yeah um Here's the Bellamy, you know, the Bellamy. Oh, I from... love that knife. That, this, that this knife is... is on my short list of knives that were the top knives that have come in so far this year. This this thing is awesome. And one thing it has is three ways to deploy. So now mm -hmm. here's something here's something that I only see working super well with a liner lock or a bolster lock. Otherwise, yeah. you're dealing with the damn 
uh, frame lock lock bar. And I don't mean to damn all of my frame locks because I love them dearly, but uh, with the uh, liner lock, you can do all of the different um, yeah. uh, different deployments and equally. Like I've said, I think you've probably heard it in a lot of my videos. I don't like front flippers in a frame lock configuration because of the size of my hands. And then I'm in a position and I don't like, I don't like front flippers that are, I don't like front flippers that are uh, a single deployment. Like I don't like front flipper only knives Oh, okay. because they feel like to do a front, where'd that one go? It's right here. I grabbed some of these because I, I figured you'd ask. Like when I get a hold of this knife, look at how I'm holding it. Now, if I'm flipping it, I've got my hand in a position where I'm really on that. Well, I, I hit the thing with my thumb. But if I'm going to use the front flipper, I have to take my hands in a position where I basically lost control of that knife. And I always feel like I'm just going to flip a front flipper out of my hand. And if, if you don't do that, but like I can do a front flipper that doesn't have a frame lock. I can do it because I'm not pushing on that with the size of my hands because I've got right. really big hands. I wear triple XL gloves. So front flippers in a frame lock configuration just don't work for me. Yeah, oh, so, I would imagine I would imagine a lot of frame locks with triple uh, with three X uh, gloves don't work, especially the more slender variety yeah. uh, flipper like a like a four fifty or something. But like this, that's pretty damn cool. Is that the artisan? Uh, sh what is that? Some sort of shark Great by white. Gavco? That's the that's the Gavco Great White. This is another knife that you want to talk about. People like oh, ch Chinese knives are garbage. The the action on this knife is comparable two thousand dollar knives and people are like oh yeah and i'm like well, no no one is I saying day -to -day that they carry i day-to-day -day carry a thousand dollar knife so yeah i'm gonna say that the action on this is comparable to this no one is saying that chinese knives are garbage i can't believe anyone would be because that would be disingenuous on the other hand i, I could see people you know totally disliking that they come from china in general I, I uh, do, but, I, but the I, knives like are, I said, I are love undeniably to see, i would love to see you and I talked about this in the first podcast we did. I, I, I think that I think that American right. companies are just unwilling to take a little bit of a cut in pay. Uh, I didn't <laughs> like my job. I took a massive cut in pay. I went from six figures. I went from a six figure a year job to I barely scrape by now and I'm much happier. And I think that some of these companies that are, are driving the manufacturing to China you need to take a good hard look at what they're actually doing because now they're closing. So now there is no production like, Oh, well, we just can't compete. You, you didn't want to compete. You wanted to, to, to lay out a price instead of trying to be competitive on price. You thought that everyone would just go, well, it's made in America. That's the sign of quality. Well, the whole problem was that people were, people were trying to get stuff made offshore. And they wanted it at the cheapest price. So that's what you got. You got garbage stuff coming out of Hong Kong, stuff coming out of Taiwan, all the toys when we were kids and they just broke immediately. Well, that's because it was made in Hong Kong. They're like, oh, they only make crap in Hong Kong and Taiwan and China. That's because that's what you wanted. You wanted to be able to sell it at the maximum amount and not pay as much for it. And you drove all those companies to put out garbage once they started putting out stuff on the way they wanted to do it then you started seeing the quality that they were capable of. Do I agree with the labor standards? No, any of these things. But I believe that our own manufacturing companies and trying to charge a premium because USA made meant something and it still does, but you can't say that we're definitely got better manufacturing anymore. So now you've driven these companies away from you and now you're out of business. And you can't figure out why you didn't try to be competitive. You tried to bank on, People will just buy it because it's American made and they'll pay whatever the price is. And to an extent that's true, but there also reaches a point like I'm not going to pay a thousand dollars for a knife, the same knife I can get for $85 because you think that you have to have this inflated price because you're banking on the U S made. Well, I think it's yeah, unfortunate. I, I think, I think the U S made is a portion of it or a, maybe even a large maybe it's the lion's share of it but i think a lot of it has to do with having to deal with unions and you know just the expenses Which i'm not that, at all trying to say i'm against unions no unions no, no are probably I'm not, one of the best things that ever happened i'm not suggesting that at, but but also for... but also that that people you know these days uh it's harder to get uh, paid a living wage here and uh you know so i i think there are a lot more struggles look when you when when there is a 
when you're a big company in China or when you are a company in China, you are kind of working with the government, you know, you're yeah. kind of a government company. So you, you get that backing. Whereas, uh, you know, if you were to start a, an OEM here, I don't think you'd and get the same. Around, there's companies, uh, there is Hephaestus, uh, Hephaestus machine works up oh, in cool. Anaheim area. Uh, they do OEM stuff. They are probably going to be working with some, you'll probably hear about them a lot more in the future. Uh, there's some places in Arizona that do machining. You've got Greg Medford. It, the The problem with it, a lot of times, like I said, is the cost of doing business. With it. I would have loved the sea snake to have been an American made knife. And I just could not afford the prototyping. No one wanted to license the design. Everyone wanted to just like, oh, just do the OEM. And I'm like, I, I can't afford you know, even at $60 a knife, if I'm selling it at a hundred, I'm making $40 per knife. That's a lot. Yeah. That's if I can get a knife down, made, actually. I mean, even I can't even <laughs> afford to do like OEM in China and sell it myself. That's still too expensive for me. So it's just like, and I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to charge me $6, what's the minimum run? And they're like, oh, well, you got to do a hundred. And I'm like, I'm looking at, at a minimum investment of, you know, at least like six to $10,000 for what I want to get done. You know, that's because I want to have the handles done and I want to, I don't want to have to do any of the assembly. Right. And then I'm still going to get a hundred knives at $30 that I have to sell myself or $60, like 6,000, you know, however yeah, yeah. much it's going to cost. Then I still have to do the footwork of selling all those knives and there's no guarantee on it. It just didn't make any sense. Oh, I mean, I think, I think designing and licensing is also a sweet gig, uh, you know, talking to Kambu about that or, um, or, uh, yeah, Kambu, uh, talk, I mean, he, he, he designs exclusively for best tech and yeah. that, that's a great gig for him. Oh, excuse me. Um, uh, I was gonna, oh, Hephaestus OEM. I love the name by the way. Hephaestus, the, the, yeah. uh, the, the, the Greek God of the forge, forge. the Greek yeah. God of the forge or yeah. the God of steel workers. Um, so the um, sea snake was the first artisan cutlery knife done in their AR RPM nine um, proprietary steel. No, they if did I, two at the same time. There was, there, was a, there was there uh, was two. There was my knife and the Ria. So they the Ria that the was Rhea. a sweet little knife too. Yeah, they released the Ria, which is like that's. I think that's why I like this so much. Is it's a really similar blade shape to this. Mm -hmm. Um, so they did that and my sea snake. Those were the first two knives. So they, they came out right at the same time. So you're AR, like, yeah. you're a steel expert with all of the, with all the knife making. I wouldn't and... say I'm an expert. If you listen to the people that complain about the things that I say on my YouTube channel, like I tried, to, I, tried I did a video where I compare, like I said, how much better damage steel is because it's monolithic. There are no layers. Oh. It's all one solid piece of steel versus forge welded Damascus. Like, oh, he doesn't always talk about it. Japanese swords were made that way. I was like, Japanese swords were made that way because they were made in substandard steel. And it was a way to purify the steel and equalize the carbon content throughout the billet. That's why they folded it because it was inconsistent. It was made from garbage black sand. It was what they had available. And they found a way to purify that steel and come up with a very good design it's still a stub it's still a substandard way to make steel forge welding is always going to be worse than monolithic steel which is one, basically one piece construction and with damage steel you get the best of both worlds you get that pattern and you get two steels that are so similar that they heat treat at exactly the same level level and you get the same hardness so it's basically like having patterned rwl 34 and you get you get it consistent throughout that billet there are no inclusions. There are no chances of delamination. You don't have to worry about difference in hardness between this steel and mm -hmm. that steel. And then you have some companies as gorgeous as it, is, as it is, there are some companies that are making steel with, they're making their Damascus with one element, that high nickel steel that will not austenize. So it's not hardening. It's not a hardening steel. It's not an austenizing steel. So you don't get the same hardness. So you'll have spots where you sharpen it and then after you use it a couple of times, you run your thumb down it and you can feel areas where that steel has deformed or worn away. And it's like a sawtooth, uh, the Vegas forge. I love those guys, but they use in some of their steels, a non austenizing steel that is a high nickel content that allows it to shine through when they fold it. And if you're just looking at it for aesthetics, that's great. Okay. But if you're looking yeah. at it for something you're going to carry out in the field and use, 
not so great. It's so, kind of like uh, um, I know uh, some some smiths will will forge copper in, uh, not not near the cutting edge, but yeah. just as a as a uh, on the outer. That's why jacket. I like clad. Clad, clad is fine. Yeah, like, that's right. gorgeous. If you want to do it, use it that's as like a clad. It's like on a sand mai. A sand mai. A sand so you have a center that, core of. A sand mai is that compromise between the two, and it's an old Japanese style. They did it in swords where they would separate the low carbon steel and the high carbon steel, and they would leave the low carbon steel, which was undesirable as the softer back. And they would jacket the harder steel in so that they had a really hard cutting edge that would harden. And then they would differentially temper it so that you get the softer back. So you have a really hard cutting edge, but there's not a chance that the whole sword is going to sh shatter. And it's something that we turned into something where you can have a high end, high speed super steel and then clad it in something that's cheaper and you get the same effect. You have a great knife with a super edge retention and you don't have to pay as much because you're not using as much of the high end expensive steel. Is that like it was a brilliant idea. ZDP or one of those? Uh, ZDP, uh, Cold Steel used to do it with their, their oh yeah, with uh, their with their San Mai. As a yeah. matter of fact, they tried to patent the the the, the, the word San Mai. Like you couldn't use it. I'm like, that's not gonna work. Japanese have been doing it since <laughs> since just after Christ was born. You know what? What about the super steels? What do you think of those? I'm on the fence with super steels. I actually have gotten to a point where there's times that I really love them. And then you get into things like, okay, Magna Cut. Everybody's on this Magna Cut thing. And I'd heard so many people say, oh, Magna Cut's soft and this and that. It's a very specific heat treat range that you have to do. It's not as forgiving. S90V, S125V. I've done knives in S125V. It's a nightmare. And you can absolutely screw it up by being 100 degrees off on your temper cycles. Mm -hmm. So what you get in that is something like as a maker you have to deal like okay what am i going to get out of it well i have a knife that i can score glass with because it's 67 68 rockwell after heat treat and temper it's never going to get dull i've made some of them my buddy tino has two knives in s125v that i did with a custom in-house heat treat and i've only ever had to sharpen one of them and he's had them for years and he uses them all the time hmm. the downside to that is stuff like maximet people are like oh maximet's the greatest thing i'm like yeah really then how come nobody's sharpening it themselves? And how come every time I get a Maximet blade, it's chipped? It's great for specific things. But when you come back to it and you look at 440, 440 is good for everything. Carbon steel, carbon steel works for anything. As long as you're not going to get rusty, as long as it's not going to 14C28N, one of the oh, yeah. original great steels that was bushcraft steel. It, it, it takes a great edge. It holds it. It's easy to sharpen. So we've gone to a point, and this happens every couple years in the knife community. Remember, we had the, the the whole HRC mafia thing that happened a few years ago, yeah. and everybody got wrapped around the axle about it. And then now, uh, transparent knives and and hinderer, they're a little dust up with it, and it just it goes in cycles where people will complain about it. But my take on it is, if you give the average knife user a knife in fourteen C twenty eight N or four forty and a knife in ZDP 189 and tell them to carry it for a month, they're not going to know the difference. So for most users, why are you paying the premium for something like ZDP 189 at 67 Rockwell or 20 CV or S125 V or S90 V? Just find a knife that's done in, in 14 C 28 N. It's going to get you what you want. And it's not, it's not got a lot of frills and bells and whistles, but it's going to do the job and you're going to be able to sharpen it and keep it up and maintain it way easier than something that is up on those upper registers. You know, a lot I of mean, the most desirable knives are made in those steels. Uh, and, you know, well, you, you brought up Hinderer. Uh, those knives are incredibly desirable, and they're all made in 20 CV or whatever the, the big steel of the day is. Um, <clears throat> so I think in a, in a sense, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's up to the makers. Um, because if you want a hinderer you're going to get it in 20 cv that's uh, well like people like bob terzuola i talk with bob all the time you know what bob makes every knife in what 154 cm that's his favorite it. steel I he won't make anything else CM. 154 cm is a good steel it doesn't it's, it's it going to drive a premium well if you're getting bob terzuola you're not paying for the steel you're paying for the craftsmanship and stuff like that that's one of that was one of my big things when i talked about the emersons that you talked about like you didn't like me because i've disparaged emersons 
I have no problem if Ernie wants to make those knives in 154CM, but you shouldn't be charging the premium price that you would get out of a knife that's better constructed, more clean, much better fit and finish in a steel that is a more desirable steel. And you're charging the same price as say a knife that is done carbon fiber, extremely well finished, and it's done in 20 CB or one of the other more desirable steels. It, it's, you know, banking on that name back to like the not wanting to take a cut and pay and things like that. And I understand they have employees and stuff like that, but you also have to look at your employees at, at a point you have to look at and say, okay, yes, we're taking a cut and pay, but you're still going to be able to come to work on Monday. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, well, everybody I mean, has to take a little bit of a cut, but at least yeah. you still have some place to come where you can make some money and pay your bills. Well, yeah, I mean, but he's managed to do it without that. But you're saying yeah. you're saying to do like to set up an OEM or to set up some sort of yeah, environment yeah. where manufacturing comes back stronger. Yes, I would love to see our manufacturing come back. Yeah, I would love too. to have an American made knife, like design an American made knife. It's it was one of my things. I tried really hard to have the stonefish, that, that tactical fixed blade that I designed, the big one. I tried really hard to get that one as an American made knife. I wanted to get it on the uh I wanted to get it on the roster of knives that people could order from the military and have it on that list of uh so it had a stock number so they could order it if they wanted. Right. Uh, because that was the knife that I designed that met all the stuff I would have wanted when I was in the military, as opposed to the stuff they gave us. So, but you can't do that because that whole Buy American Act that the military has, like you're not going to get a stock number for a Chinese made item. Here's here's something interesting. Uh, I recently got uh, a knife that I saw uh, a, a YouTuber that I really like, Nav Sergeant. Uh, he's got great taste in knives and he's he's someone who's constantly got a lot of nice high-end things coming through and he did this very excited video about a new american knife to give uh the the royal triumvirate you know talking about chris reeve knives strider and um hinderer give them a run for their money or joins their crew and it's the resco instruments uh, that's a Ooh. watch company uh Mekong Delta Combat Folder Gooseworks is the name they give their. I like that their knife. It's beautiful. It's awesome. I bought it. I like. I ran to the website, bought it, got it. I. It's solid. It has a nice, sort of heavy feel, but there's a lot of uh, weight relief in there. Everything about it's got that nice hydraulic, and then, uh, and then come to find out a couple weeks later, it's made by Best Tech, yeah. and. And I, I love Best Tech. I really do. I think they're my favorite I, I all around OEM. But I but I, I'd have to say that my favorite all around OEM right now, and Artisan, don't get upset. Right now, I think that Kaiser has really, really upped their game to a point where they, they are probably making some of the best knives out there. Bookmark that. Hang on one second. Cause I agree. And I'm on a little Kaiser kick myself. Um they're not out but uh <laughs> this thing one a, a real big ingredient of this was the mystique of knowing that two old frogmen you know made this in in their basement in north carolina and i don't know why i'm saying i, I keep saying north carolina when i talk about it uh but they do it is two old frogmen or or a company owned by frogmen and mm -hmm. to me and their first knife they put out was American made. So I, I made the assumption along with Naf Sergeant and others that this was USA made. They never said on their website that it's USA made. I just, so part of this purchase that made this so easy for me to purchase for a pretty penny was the mystique of thinking that it was made in America. Oh, there, she, there is. Oh, I've got, I've got something to say about that one. Okay, let well, me hear ahead. it. No, well, no, no, well, well they, there was no actual deception on their part because they never said, this is made in America. I just made all these assumptions, and it's got a feel, man. They got the feel down. This does not well, feel like a washer, a smooth washer Chinese knife. It does not it looks feel like, like an old, it, you know what it looks like? It, it reminds me a lot of the old SOG demo. The, not, I don't mean the one that SOG knives made yeah. now. Yes, I mean I know the original, about. like eight were only ever made. There's only one in existence now. The big, nasty, ooh, I get goosebumps just thinking about that knife. I would, 
not necessarily give up a testicle, but let you bruise one real bad to borrow that for like a week. <laughs> Okay. That thing that's is not gorgeous, necessary. but that is kind of that same blade style in that SOG demo with the saw teeth on the back, but it's got that definite, like, you know, that's a purpose built knife. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's gorgeous. And I do dig that. I really do like that. Yeah. This um, is a cool one. Che I mean, check it out. I, I think it's great. I love it. I haven't probably let... sent that to me. I haven't got uh, to see one yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I haven't, uh, I haven't let that. Oh, there's. I'm still a honeymoon, but, but. Oh yeah, I know. You know, soon something will come in and eclipse it. But you were gonna say something about about. I was gonna say something being about misled that. or. Oh, yeah, I was gonna say something about like, okay, and this is one like I don't usually indulge in the whole. I'm not TMZ. I don't indulge in the <laughs> drama. Right. But um, our friend over at. Uh, Crap. This is how much I I, I, could, I don't even register his name. Uh, help me out here. Recently, Jake, Jake Hoback. Okay. So, like, I never, I, I've said it in videos, like, Jay, Jake Hoback is never going to be somebody that I'm going to consider a friend. And I was like, his knives, the Quayback, is a well-built knife. It's not a knife for me. It's very well-built. Um, but Jake went out of his way to make life miserable for Jason Browse. When everybody found out that Jason Browse was not technically breaking any rules, he was ordering things milled and machined in China and bringing them stateside for final assembly and adding more than 51%, significantly more than 51% of the overall value of the knife and saying, which is legal, saying it was an American made product because it was. More than 51% of the overall value of the item added to it in the United States through assembly, finishing, whatever you're doing, is considered American made. And Jake Hoback led the fucking charge on that and almost ran Jason Browse out of business. And here we go. Just a few years later, what happens? Through a lie of omission, Jake Hoback did the exact same thing. Every he knew that those he knew that those retailers were saying they were American made knives. He knew that he was allowing them to do that and he continued to just bump up those profits. And I'm just saying, like, I, I don't wish bad on anyone, and I hope he can recover from it. But, like, if you're going to be the guy that's leading the charge on that, you shouldn't be the guy that gets caught doing it later. Yeah, that I, really I, I, pissed, I, I... It really pissed me off when it happened the first time, because knowing that Jason Browse had broke no laws, is it, is, it, is it kind of a dirty dealing thing? Well, Boeing does it. They say their planes are made in America, and they yeah. order everything from China, and they build yes. it here. Oh, it's on. made here. The parts aren't made here. But when you come back to it, like even American made knives, where'd you get your steel from? Where was the titanium sourced from? Yeah. Like, we don't have titanium. Jake, we you have titanium protest veins too much, here. sir. Yes. Yeah. That is, that is, you know, I that, just think the lady protests too much. It, it's always the, it's always the loudest voice, man. Uh, yeah. You know, who's, and who's... I, just, I just think in my heart because i love jason and he's a great dude and i've talked to him a lot i want to get him on a podcast but he's he's really shy especially after that all happened mm -hmm. and we've talked about doing it but the fact is like to see that and then see it happen i, I don't usually wish ill on people but it just kind of made i was like karmic retribution the yes. universe has a tendency yes. to equal things out yes so i was just kind of happy to see it happen I, I think I, I, jake hoback's name is mud and and unfortunately and and i don't like to put it that way which but is I sad think, because like the I knives that to, he did make are great That's, yeah and, the uh, quayback is a great great knife and and this summit i had the summit uh through the pass around group that big knife oh my god i loved it i was uh it was it, it it is openly made in China. I mean, the, on the website, it talks. This is one of his newer designs. And, you the know, sumo. Since... the sumo was the one that I saw. Sumo is cool, too. I, I kind of dig that. That's not too bad. That's a pretty good the, design. And the, I saw uh, his axis he made. I the summit like is, is in the same spirit of the sumo. Kind of that modern, looks like a shuttle craft from a spaceship. But mm -hmm. feels great. I've seen it. I just haven't got the handle one. Oh, man. It's unfortunate because it's like a $620 knife. Made in China by Jake Hoback. You kind of kind of wish it would be a little bit less, you know, uh, than those American-made prices we were talking about earlier. What 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 have you seen? You've been in the knife world for a, a considerable time, and b by that I mean, you know, an active person within that community. Um, I think making... I started the channel like ten years ago. So yeah, it's been about ten years since I started my YouTube channel. What have you? 
what have you seen? Like, what what is the overall movement that you've seen uh, in the knife world? Uh, what changes have you seen? What how do you think things have evolved, and where do you think we're going? I, I've I've seen the I've seen the change from the big beefy overbuilt you know one point eight you know, 0.187 blade stock thickness, and it's 0.4 behind the edge because you think that's going to hold up better down to the thin blade stock and, and behind the edge thickness of like 0.012, stuff like that, where it's a really slicey knife. And then people have realized that like, you know what, it doesn't have to be so thick to hold up. Like if I'm going out in the woods, and I'm going to chop down a tree. Yeah, I want that big, beefy, thick behind the edge. But for my day to day, I don't want something like that. So that's been a big thing. But I would say one of the ones that I think that I've seen a trend going to, and it's in the budget knife stuff that I don't like is, and we'll use this knife. This knife is so good and it's great, but that pocket clip is almost as thick as the knife itself. And anybody that's ever taken Japanese uh, blade edged weapons, swords, you know that these two fingers, those are the ones that hold your grip. Like if you're doing it right, you can hold a sword with these two fingers, if mm -hmm. you're holding it properly. These are there for guidance. These are there for power. If you try to hold a knife with these two fingers, you're gonna have cramps all day. Why would you put that pocket clip right in the area where the two fingers that are gonna do the most to grip on that knife are pinching it into your hand? I, I, the thing that I wish would change, the thing that's gotten better is we've moved away from like these crazy thick behind the edge thicknesses, which I still like some of my old beefy overbuilt stuff. But the thing I want to get away from is let the knife designer design the clip. Great clip. All of my Farron Forge knives, great clips. Knives that people are designing the entire thing. The clips are amazing. That, um, where'd it go? This one. Mm. I, guarantee, I guarantee you that Mike had input on how that clip was made. Anything that Bob Terzuola has done production style has his typical, like, milled almost like a, like a, a like a combination milled bent clip, uh, a lot like this, where you have it milled out and yep. then it comes down. By, by using the off the shelf pocket clips, that these companies are using, you're detracting from it. And I, I like, I will, I will say that a pocket clip can be a non-starter for me. Like, oh, that pocket mm -hmm. clip sucks. I don't want to have to go to the trouble to find a pocket clip that fits it. It's not going to hurt my hands. I just won't buy that knife. So, I mean, we've, we've gone some directions, we've gone great. And then other things that we've done is like the, the over the top finishes that you're getting on knives that are in a, in a range where we can afford them. That's great. Custom knife makers, designing knives that now can be produced and come at, uh, the, the Jim Skelton fixed blades that Riat did. I can't afford one of Jim's knives. I love Jim. His knives are great. I can't afford one of his knives, but you know what I can do? I can get a knife that looks almost identical to it from Riat for a fraction of the price. The, the adopting of production versions of a knife uh, that you couldn't get your hands on. Like I, the cheapest I've ever seen a Terzuola was $1,700. And that was at a show and Nico bought it. My little buddy Nico bought it. And it was a 75 for 75 Terzuola, 75 knives for his 75th birthday. Oh yeah. I remember that that is amazing. Yeah. That's still a good price for that knife, but that's the cheapest you're ever going to find one. Bob has now produced his designs through several productions. Yeah. And I'm like, that's amazing because it takes a knife that most people will never get to have and provides you with an opportunity to carry a knife that's designed by that person that follows the same lines, has the same, almost the same scrutiny because, you know, Bob's not going to put his name on something that he doesn't stand behind. And you're getting something that typically you would never see in your life and you get to carry it and it's yours. So it, it's a lot like offering multiple price points on a knife like Farron Forge does that. Now with some of their their uh, their knives, their production knives, you have an eighty nine dollar version of the Stinger. Now you have a two hundred and ten dollar version if you want to get a titanium frame lock version yeah. with with carbon fiber inlays. You have that choice. Yeah, and that's I, a big thing. More that, production that is... means that you have more options and you can buy what you wanted to always have in yeah. some form. That is exactly. Uh, I love Boker for that. I, I love a lot of companies for that. I, I will never, I say this never, I shouldn't say this. It will be years before I own a Charles Marlowe custom knife, but I can right? own the Squail. I mean, that's my that's my dream knife I'll right there. I'll never own a Burnley. I'll never own a Burnley. They're so insanely expensive, but the one that Boker makes, 
Yeah. It's a pretty good, it's a pretty good representation of his designs. And I love that little Boker, uh, Burnley. What is, what is that one? The, the, the Quaken. Quaken, the Burnley Quaken. I love that knife. <laughs> Dude, I, I like joke those... about that knife a lot because, because that knife has about 20 to 25 different versions. Oh uh, yeah. Light, light, small, automatic, short, mm -hmm. what have you. Anyway, uh, Mike, I could go on and on and on. Oh, we could, but, we would, uh, if, we, if, you, if Jim would let us. But yeah. uh, we'll do a couple of minutes extra, if you don't mind, on the other side for, for our patrons. And no, that's uh, I'll ask you some scandalous questions. Oh, okay. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for coming on the show. I, 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 uh, as we no, record I this. Scandalous questions. No, I do not have birds hiding under my boot. <laughs> I know. Uh, I know you Just do. We all know, uh, we, we've all been seeing the crumbs falling out. Uh, Mike, Mike Emler, Crazy Sharp, uh, let everyone know how they can find you uh, on uh, it's, social media. It's really easy. It's uh, See where it says Mike Emler, Crazy Sharp? Basically, if you search that on YouTube, you can find me. I stopped putting much uh, anything, much of anything up on uh, Instagram that was of any knife content because it just doesn't do anything. Uh, I did some little test runs and nothing I put up that was knife related. Uh, goes anywhere but it is it is uh crazy sharp llc on instagram i think i changed it to because it yeah. was just too much uh, and i was shadow banned for a while so you had to type the entire thing in so it was michael underscore emler underscore crazy underscore sharp underscore llc no no one knew where i was at so <laughs> um but i am on twitter and getter and true social a couple places I, th wow. I think that's the ones that you can access. I have a gilded server for my paying YouTube members that I've set up. It's not like Discord, but I don't like Discord's uh, political biases. So I vote with my cash. So I set up a Amen. gilded server as opposed to a Discord. Uh, well well and, done, uh, Mike. Emma. Like well, oh, thanks also, for Rumble. I have a channel on Rumble as well. Everything you see on my YouTube Rumble. channel comes up automatically. So if I post a video on YouTube, if you don't want to support YouTube, you can go right to Rumble and I have the same thing that goes up, I think, yeah. the day after. Yeah, Jim has suggested that we might do that. All right. Well, Mike, thanks for coming on the show. As always, no it's a pleasure talking with you. And uh, I'll see you shortly. Okay. All right. Take care. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. You heard him, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Emler's putting out so much content on YouTube right now. You, you have to subscribe. His channel's awesome. And like I said, his, uh, his close up, uh, uh, reviews are really excellent. The man knows what he's talking about. So check it out. Uh, and then check us out here, uh, next week for another great interview show and Wednesdays for the midweek supplemental. And of course, Thursday nights for Thursday night lives, our live stream on uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Also, you can download all the podcasts, uh, uh, right uh, to your favorite podcast app uh, listed to the left of my face. All right. For uh, Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast